So we sort of started. Oh, yep. Okay, now we sort of started. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think you suggested a good plan for today, which is basically to try to do the stuff that we were trying to do last time, but do it better, roughly speaking. Um, yeah. to start doing lots of examples of the belief method. Um, and doing it better in part means doing it more systematically, but we're not really gonna do it completely systematically. Of course, we never do things completely systematically. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just imagine for a moment if we did try to do this systematically, then one of the things that we would really have to do is we would have to have like a complete mastery of how classical combinatorial stuff about Young diagrams, like, you know, the Littlewood Richardson rule and all that kind of stuff, how that manifests as functorial operations on the syntactic category of, you know, free on one object. Um, and I don't, I certainly don't have that mastery at my fingertips. I, pres I presume you don't really either, um, particularly the sort of functorial aspect of it. Is that true? <laughs> Uh, well, when you say Littles and Richard would, uh, Little and <laughs> Rules, I can't even say it much. Yeah, so I don't have it yeah. that completely mastered. I, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know things about it. I can fake much of it, but that's, that's exactly what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about faking it. I'm talking about, well, anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of talking about, again, I mean, one of the goals here is that the, belief method should, should eventually become actually automated and, you know, act, an actual method. And, you know, so I'm thinking about that kind of thing. Uh, um, but also, so, so there's, there's, there's a kind of a gap to bridge here, which is that, I mean, the belief method works very wide variety of contexts. For example, it works over the base of sets. It also works over the base of complex vector spaces. And it's really the same methods, the exact same method in each. But mm -hmm. when you're fooling around with it, it can feel pretty different and it can feel tricky to bridge the gap. Even, you know, if, if, told you, if we really understood what we were doing, if we were really doing this systematically, we would be very clear that we would see that we're doing the same thing when we're working over sets as we're working over complex vector spaces. Whereas when we're faking it, it often has the flavor that if you're working over sets, you can see exactly what's going on conceptual, but you, you often don't have very efficient rules for calculation. Whereas, you know, if you're working over complex vector spaces, then it's like I say, it's a little bit harder to see uh, conceptually how, you know, these intricate combinatorial rules, like the Littlewood Richardson rule, how those are secretly really very conceptual things about tensor product of, uh, of syntactic constructions. Um, so, um, so, uh, uh, you know, so we don't have that ideal mastery of both flavors of the of of the belief method, but that's okay. We'll you know fake it and have fun as we go. Um, and um, well, right. So right, I mean, right. So part right. So yeah. So I was trying to say that you know when you're working over complex vector spaces, they're very slick calculational methods. But you don't, you know, but they're sometimes they're a little bit harder to grok what's how it's what's secretly going on conceptually, you know, how functorial operations of substitution or tensor product, you know, it's it's, it's a whole separate game understanding that conceptual interpretation of the functorial right. operation. Um, so like I say, we'll be we'll 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 be faking it to some extent, especially I'll be faking it. Um, I mean, Todd and Joe and yeah. I wrote this paper on yeah. <clears throat> sure functors and young diagrams. And so we did get rigorous about a bunch of things. But one thing we didn't do is yeah. show how like all sorts of nice conceptual rules for tensoring representations or substituting sure functors like the yes. 
we didn't we didn't put any work into showing how those match up with the more traditional calculational well that's rules. that conceptual gap that i'm talking about that you know ideally you would bridge those perfectly and you would uh yeah but we didn't need to because <laughs> yeah. because we were able to rigorously describe all the operations in a conceptual way and that was good enough for us i mean it would be really nice of course to then take that and then push it forward to actually uh, getting the nitty, nitty gritty uh, okay well we'll see how it goes i mean I, I you know you might be better at a lot of this than me but uh, you might be more in practice than me at a lot of stuff but we'll see how it goes so um so So what am I trying to say here? Um, so uh, I mean that's that's one issue. The uh, well, also when I say the very slick ways of working over complex vector spaces, I mean I, I mean a big part of that is that you very often you're working in these things that are secretly really just two vector spaces, right? You have a basis, and uh, you know you have like a a thing that's just a, a, a two vector space that's literally or almost literally free on that uh, basis. And that just gets really slick and powerful algorithms and things, but sometimes you might not, sometimes that slickness can hide the conceptual history and interpretations of things. Um, so yeah, so that's one issue. Now there's an, another issue here. What is the other issue? The other issue is that, um, yeah, we're trying to learn the belief method here. So the belief method for understanding and calculating with the syntactic categories of theories in our doctrine. Um, but but there's, there's another thing that we're sort of learning at the same time, which is almost opposite to the belief method, but they sort of complement each other in a certain way. And we already started talking about it a bit. Uh, so the belief method is very syntactic in a way. I mean, I guess you could philosophically argue about it, but in some sense, it's very syntactic. But there's uh, this more, again, you could argue about it, perhaps more blatantly semantic approach where you work with these uh, affine algebraic groupoids and also affine algebraic categories and you get total two rigs from them you get uh um these two rigs of co-modules of such objects and um so you know these are two sources two very complementary almost opposite sources of getting two rigs and it's very interesting to play them off against each other. And we've already started on that. Um, and um, so uh, let's see. So yeah, well, let's start with an example here and we'll see that complementary, those complementary approaches both coming into play here. So we're actually thinking about um, the theory of uh, well, let's see. I mean, we're thinking about many theories, but um, one particular one. Well, let's let's. Yeah, how do I say this? Um, I'll start out by saying it from the uh, from the affine algebraic groupoid viewpoint. So again, affine algebraic groupoid. That's sort of an algebraic geometry term, but if you sort of make it a little more algebraic, then a synonym for it is, uh, I find algebraic groupoid is commutative Hopf algebroid, commutative Hopf algebroid. And if, if you don't want to worry about the oids, you can just take what the oids off of both halves of that. So uh, an affine algebraic group Basically, a synonym for that is commutative Hopf algebra. And um, yeah, so let's let's in fact start off with a commutative Hopf algebra here, um, and uh, or an affine algebraic group, same thing. Uh, so let's start off with GL two. 
You want to share your screen? Okay. <laughs> I forgot I turned it off. All right. So how do I do that now? Don't tell me. Let's see. Uh, it's right there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There it goes. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to decide whether I should say GL2 or GL2, comma C. I guess I'll say GL2, comma the complex numbers. So I'm actually thinking of this as a what did I call it? A commutative Hopf algebra over the complex numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, well, so, so that means in particular, it's a commutative ring. So let's actually write down a presentation for that commutative ring, okay? So do you wanna do it or should I do it? Complex numbers join some variables and those variables should be the entries of our two by two matrix. So maybe we'll call them A, B, C, D. Okay. And then I guess we should have one more variable, which would be uh, E. And the relator should, should say that, uh, sorry, let me of course that out. The relator should say that, uh, yeah, I think I think this left-handed thing is working better than when it was right-handed. Um, it should say that E is the inverse of the determinant. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm sort of impressed that you're actually doing this. That you're actually they actually mean it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's um. It's actually useful. So um, see, I'm just waiting to see what <laughs> happens with this. I'm just trying to decide how I should write it. Maybe I should write it that uh, I should say one over this is equal to E or something like that. But I mean, that's just a soppy way of saying yep. whatever the real thing is. Okay, so that's a commutative algebra. And you can put the co-multiplication on it to make it into uh, the algebraic group in the expected way. The co-multiplication is secretly encoding the multiplication of these two by two matrices. These, in, what do we call them? Invertible two by two matrices. That's what these are. Yep. And um, so. Uh, Yeah, so in fact, this is a commutative Hopf algebra over the complex numbers. And um, so am I saying this right? Let's see. So we can think of this as the algebra of representative functions for the representations of this group you know, the finite dimensional rep representations of this group. So every, what am I trying to say? Um, if you take one of the EREPs of this group, then you can get a function on the group by, well, you, 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 so we have two by two matrices. So we have a two by two grid. You pick a point in that grid and you know each element of what am I trying to say here? <laughs> I mean, I thought you were going to say you take a representation, yeah, and you put a vector in it, and you take a dual vector on it, yeah, and then you get a representative function. So that's yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that, that's the way of saying it. I was, I was. Yeah fumbling around trying to say it some other way, but yeah. So, so yeah, but I'm trying to say I'm, they're like, is there, is, is there another name? I was, I, was trying, I was trying to emphasize the idea that the, what these functions are really doing is they're giving you matrix entries of the action of uh, the group element 
-hmm. in some representation. And that gives you the basic functions. Perhaps it's even true that all of these polynomials are, are, are matrix entry functions of some kind like that for some representation, not necessarily irreducible or something like that. And there's some big connection between the multiplication of these representative functions. Am I getting it right? And the, <laughs> am I getting it back backwards? Yeah, I think that's right. Between the multiplication of the representative functions and the tensor product of the reps. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, one of the reasons I'm going into detail about this is, to, is, is that, you know, forget that this is a commutative algebra, but just, just think of it as a commutative co-algebra and think of what its structure is like as a, I didn't say commutative co-algebra or something, what, I, I, it's as a co-algebra, yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not co-commutative or anything like that. Um, uh, so do you have a clear sense of what the co-algebra structure is like? Have you ever thought of the co-algebra structure in isolation, what it's like? Yeah, it's sort of like, well, I used to. So it's sort of like matrix multiplication written yes. backwards. Yes, know. I was gonna say, these are co-matrix co-algebras direct summed together. And the reason for emphasizing that, I mean, you're agreeing with that, right? That's what you were saying, essentially. I'm just- But it is a plural sum together? Yes, for each ear rep, there's this uh, co-matrix co-algebra oh. for that ear rep. Oh, I was just thinking about the, I thought you were talking about the, that, um, that this algebra you wrote down here is a co-algebra and there's a sort of, I think if I'm not mixed up, there's a sort of simple formula for multiplication in terms of these A, B, C, D, and E, which you just sort of. Yes, 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 okay, yes, but yes, that, but, but. So they are, I mean, they are, those guys, A, B, C, and D anyway, sure. they are representative functions of the. Functional. Yes, they're very basic ones or sub-basic ones or something like that. But what was I trying to say that um, the, what am I trying to say that, uh, it, it sounds to me like what you were doing, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like you were, you know, exploiting the fact that we have a commutative algebra here and you were writing the co-multiplication as a homomorphism of commutative algebras. And you can, and, and because of that, you can just slickly write it down as a single, yeah, okay. Uh, but, homomorphism. Yeah, okay. You're trying to not do that. For yeah, that's right. I'm deliberately trying to not do that. I'm trying to ignore the commuter. Just take this underlying co-algebra and in isolation as a co-algebra, forgetting that it's a commuter algebra. Can you describe what the co what the co-algebra structure is? I guess I would well, start to of, give it away. Yeah. Well, you sort of did, but yes. I mean, yeah. sort of in a sketchy way. So, I mean, you have to figure out how everything well, the way you were doing it, you were going to figure out how everything in there is a representative function, or at least enough, at least a basis of them is. Right, and, one for each year rep and break the, you know, break this co-algebra co up into some ands. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. yeah, so there's like the, there's like the zero dimensional representation of GL, the one dimensional representation of GL2C gives you a really boring sum and, and then the two dimensional representation of GL2C, which gives you the really visibly obvious. The thing visibly, visibly obvious thing. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then there's the three dimensional. Well, I guess I'm left out some. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a three dimensional one, which would be some kind of quadratic polynomials in A, B, C, and D. Yes, did you mention that there's a, a bunch of different um, one-dimensional ones? Did you mention that? No, I was thinking about SL2C. Sure. Yeah. So there's like more, yeah, okay. Sure, that's, that's right. That's part of the yeah. trick or subtlety or whatever yeah. of what right. we're trying to understand today. Right. So um, e, will, e will shine 
yes uh, for one dimensional ones yes that's that sounds right uh yes that, that yeah that, that makes good good sense so um what am i trying to say like i say it's a a direct sum of co-matrix co-algebras, one, one, you know, indexed, this direct sum is indexed by the isomorphism classes of EREPs. And, um, and I have to stop and think about this terminology, direct sum, because I was already getting confused by it, but, you know, I was thinking, is this the evil one or is this the good one? I think this is the really good one. It's, um, <laughs> am I saying it right? So it's like, how can that be? I mean, it's like, uh, ah, yes. Right, so, so that, right, this is playing the role of, right, in the world of co-algebras, this is sort of like the sum of co-algebras. Geometrically, it's sort of like a sum. So I guess what I'm saying is, supposing we were doing this, supposing, you know, so we're, in a way, we're sort of playing some Tanaka crane game here. Um, uh, you know, just with co-algebras, well, also with Hopf algebras, but uh, what am I trying to say that um, if, if, if you start taking Cartesian products of commutative rings and you start thinking about how the module category of the uh, product ring, how that relates to the module categories of the factor rings, then everything's fine until you start taking infinite products. And then it gets very ugly. There's like, I don't know. I, I'm always tempted to think that like ultra filters are going to creep into the story and ruin everything or something like that. But um, that's exactly what doesn't happen if we're doing if we're playing this dual game. If we're playing this dual game, then um, you know there's just this beautiful relationship between co-module categories of co-algebras and the direct sum of co-algebras. Um, so that when you take this big countable infinite direct sum of these co-matrix co-algebras, um, the co-module categories behave beautifully. Um, that's why we're getting this two vector space with this basis. So there's no, there's no weird unexpected co-modules. Everything is just, you know, the finite, you know, the, 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 the very classical finite dimensional representations that you're that you're used to when you're thinking of this as like related to a compact group or something like that or the holomorphic representations or something like that so are you buying this <laughs> um I'm, I'm not so quite so familiar with that it reminds me a whole bunch of this yeah. other thing which is that if you have a co-algebra every element in it lives in a finite dimensional sub Co-algebra. It's certainly related to that. It's certainly sure, related to that. Yeah. But um, but it's, uh, this is somehow prior to that. I, it, it feels to me like it's prior to that. It just is, you know, it's it's right. It's the fact that you're doing I mean, there's something nice about direct sums of vector spaces versus Cartesian products of vector spaces. Cartesian products of vector spaces are somehow ill-behaved when they start getting infinite. Um, but the direct sums, you know, they still have the... Isn't this right? Mm -hmm. Perfect distributivity with respect to tensor product and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the Cartesian products get real annoying precisely because they don't agree with the with, with the co-products when you start getting infinite. So there's just, right, I mean, right. I mean, and part of it, right, maybe another part is just that we have this Cartesian closed category of uh, co-commutative co-algebras, where we don't have this, right, the, the category of commutative rings is not Cartesian closed. So there's a lot of special nice things for various reasons about the commutative mm -hmm. co-algebras here. But in particular, it's giving us a very nice algebraic way of thinking about representation theory. And, and that is because you take, you know, the way to get this nice algebraic interpretation of the finite dimensional representations is to look at the co-modules of a commutative co-algebra. 
And that's what we're doing here. So um, yeah, so 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 that's what that's what legitimizes this picture that we were drawing of uh, of the representations of of the co-modules of this commutative Hopf algebra. Um, uh, so it's like a half infinite checkerboard or something like the picture. Let's see, I should pick out one of these dots to be the, the tensor unit. So maybe I'll circle it in red or something like that. Supposed to be right there. And um, uh, you know what? I think I have to draw this picture again. I don't think it's anywhere near big enough. Might be good if I had like a magnification, automatic mag magnification button or something like that. Because right, each young diagram is supposed to give you one of these dots. I mean, here we're gonna run out of uh, all of the young diagrams with more than two rows are gonna get suppressed. So it's really just two row young diagrams that are corresponding to these dots. And it's really just corresponding to some of the dots. And um, so yeah, so we're doing a game here for GL2. It's very interesting, but you should really think of this as in parallel with all the other cases. Uh, as we're doing this, you know, you should be thinking about the analogous picture for GL1. And you should also be thinking about the analogous picture for GL3 and GL4, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the GL2 case is rather photogenic because it fits nicely on paper in this way. It's a two-dimensional picture. But the GL3 case is also very nicely photogenic. You just need to have 3D vision. Um, so it should be very interesting to look at the, it is very interesting to look at the 3D variation of this and to understand the ways in which they relate to each other. And it's, there's some, tricky but good things going on in, in terms of understanding these pictures. So uh, yeah, let me try let me try let me try to draw it a little bit bigger here. So how do I do this? You do have a thing that says resize near the really? upper left there. Resize upper left. At least give it a try. <laughs> okay. Okay. I wonder what's going to happen. Uh, well, just type some number other than 100. Probably want to be sized by the same amount in both. All right, so 200? Give it a try. OK, good. It's defaulting to. Yeah, give it a shot. I'm curious. Just click OK and see what happens. Wow, OK. OK, well, that's bigger. Does it mean that? You know, did it well anyway? It's, it's yeah. there. Can you we'll still see. draw at the normal size? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably not, but whatever. Else. Now I'm really tempted to make it even bigger. <laughs> well, see what happens if you try to draw. I'm afraid you're going to like be drawing twice as big, too. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. But let me try. Uh, yeah, I like this. It's kind of experimentation where we don't know what we're doing. Uh, so okay. Now oh, that's good. Great. Uh -huh. Okay. You yeah, can eventually, eventually, I should really learn how to do all this stuff. But okay, so I think I think that's encouraging to make it three hundred or something like that. Uh, so how how do I do this with the resize button? All right, let's try. Oh wow! No, but now it thinks. <laughs> <Don't>... Oh. <laughs> now... So what number should I do? This is well, too, the arithmetic, the arithmetic is too difficult for me to figure out. So oh, well, 150 if you wanted 300. 150? I was gonna I was gonna put 167 or something like that. But you're probably right. It's probably okay, 150. Let me try. I'll try 200. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gonna go off. You just want to at your own time you can try to like keep expanding sure. ever more. You uh, see atomic level resolution of the <laughs> Can I find this? Is, is it here somewhere? Damn. 
Oh, did it cut it you off? You have to move left and right. You got to move that. Oh, that person, you think it is? You think it's still there? Like spent all our time doing it. But now you're at the way bottom. Of the <laughs> you got to move back up. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> but see, I'm not sure it's really there. It's there. It's just like you've expanded so much. It's, uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the incredible shrinking man. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let's see. I would click undo and stop messing with this. I'm getting bored. Okay, 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 okay. But it's fun. Um, yeah. Now, where is it? Where, where did it do? It completely went off? No. Okay. And that is here. All right, let's try that. Let's try that. Let's try that. So I want to try. So let's see. So that's the degenerate young diagram where the red circle is. Yep. And um, let's see. I'll put young diagrams in, in green, maybe. So is this the way it goes? And what is this one? Is it like that? This one is like that? Does this seem right? Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm con yeah, I might, but I'm confused. So let's see. So, <clears throat> so I agree with you that all the two row young diagrams are going to give one dimensional representations. So like the yeah, the one with two boxes, it's a vertical there. That's the determinant representation. Um, yeah, yes. So the, the vertical axis is giving you the number of height two columns. Yeah, I'm just kidding. And, and, the, and the horizontal axis is giving you the number of height one columns in the Young diagram. Yeah, I'm just a bit confused about why you're Drawing it in this sort of these dots in this kind of diamondy way. So, like, what does the vertical coordinate mean? Yes. The, so the vertical coordinate means um, the vertical coordinate means. Uh, don't tell me. That's the. I want to say it's the GL one. So when you're restricted to a representation of GL1, what are you? Well, that's, a, that's okay. That's a little bit tricky. Let's see. So, because when you restrict irreducible representations, they're no longer irreducible. These, right, these dots are just irreps. So mm -hmm. I'm getting a little bit confused here, uh, but, you know, it, it really is this philosophy of two vector spaces. You know, there's some sort of two linear operator that we're drawing here, but I am getting mixed up about whether the, the relevant two linear operator here, whether it is co-induction or restriction or some other variation on those. Um, I'm just curious why that, the, the one, for example, why the one box Young diagram is sort of halfway between the, empty diagram and the two box diagram in terms of the vertical coordinate. It seems like you're saying that there's like some kind of representation of GL1 that's halfway between the trivial representation and the determinant of GL2 <laughs> representation. Say that once yeah. again, that's halfway between what the? 
like why is that one box diagram yeah halfway between the zero box diagram and the vertical two box diagram so partially because it's a vertical coordinate because that's a spinner representation it's not a representation of pgl uh two so the, the horizontal axis is pgl2 well <laughs> it's actually sort of both pgl2 and sl2 um right it's 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 the the even numbered columns is pgl2 and the odd numbered columns uh, those are the ones that only SL2 possesses. PGL2 does not possess those representations. <coughs> those are, you know, fermion <coughs> or something like that. Uh, I was asking about the vertical coordinate. So why is that one box diagram halfway vertically between the big red thing and the two box vertical? Well, um, like I say, the, the horizontal axis through the red circle. Mm -hmm. That is the representations of PGL2. So we don't want to include the spinner representations on that axis. So, you know, uh, we get a basis for the PGL2 representations by taking that horizontal axis. So we don't want the spinner representations on there. And you know there are two basic spinner representations that are dual to each other, so they sort of fit. You know, ones on the top of that, ones on the bottom of that. So um, yeah, so there's a there's a kind of uh, important sub thing like that. And it, it, so let me tell you what that is, okay? That's, well, I, I've, I've said this before, the last time, this is the positive representations of GL2, meaning that it's, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing, it doesn't contain any, uh, it's not, it's uncontaminated by the dual representation, right? The dual representation is that one, it's like right there. Where? See where? I'm, I'm sort of circling. Maybe I can. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a fun. Um, so, uh, so let's think about this. Supposing we had, so, okay, we have a commutative hop value. Right, and these are its these dots are its irreducible co-modules, and so because they're irreducible, so you can think of this as a basis for a two-vector space, roughly speaking. Um, so these are the irreducible co-modules of this very reducible or completely reducible co-algebra, even though it's infinite-dimensional. Um, and um, and we have we have a uh, we have a bi we have I, I guess a sub bi algebra of our Hopf algebra here. So just leave out the generator E. Mm -hmm. And because you're leaving out the generator E, you don't have that relator. And um, and but you still have a bi algebra, and you don't have right. You don't have a Hopf algebra anymore, but you do still have a bi algebra, right? It's the algebra. It's the affine algebraic monoid of two by two matrices without any invertibility restriction. And um, so that's still a bi-algebra. So it's still a co-algebra. And think of what its co-modules are like. And that's what the 
that's what we're depicting in the picture here. We're, we're depiction we're, we're you know there's there's a subset of this basis that is a basis for the co-modules of this co-algebra co or mod co-modules co of this bi-algebra. And, um, you know, so that's the theory of something. That's the theory of something. So, right, when you sketch these out, this, this thing that I've sort of, this wedge that I've outlined in yellow here, that's the syntactic category. That turns out to be, I mean, it's, I mean, we've said that it's the co-module category of a bi-algebra, this matrix uh, monoid, this affine algebraic matrix monoid. It's the co-algebra, co it's the co-modules of that. But we can describe that total two rig, uh, we can sketch it in, in, you know, using the belief method in a syntactic way. And um, from that point of view, it's the theory of an object of subdimension two, meaning uh, it's the theory of the theory of uh, an object v such that the morphism from the initial object or the zero object to um, to what what is it that this young diagram that that should be an isomorphism that 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 object should be the zero object um, and um, I mean, perhaps we could also write that in a more suggestive way. So can you, is that visible? You can see it's a, this, I wrote as T subscript and then this syntactic sketch of the theory. It's visible on, uh, even as though it's a pale color. Um, no. But I think some other people would prefer to write that in for what for them is a more suggestive way. They would write it as something like, uh, the category of C, the category of vector, category of complex vector spaces, whatever their notation is for that, and then a join, an object V, uh, you know, modulo uh, this. You know, to suggest that you're, that this sketch of the total two rig is like a categorified version of a presentation of a commutative ring. But, I, but I'm, used to, I'm used to writing it in this notation up here, but I don't know, maybe I should switch to the other one. I don't know. But I mean, so there's a theorem to be proved there, right? I mean, I'm making a claim. Um, what's your attitude to this claim? You believe it or you think it's obvious or you, you're willing to entertain it as a possibility or- um, Willing to enter- Tainted. I've often been, I've often wondered about a more semantic description of this theory you have in the yellow box. So, I mean, I like, I like yes. hearing that, that it is something. <laughs> yes. Um, I never, I never guessed that it was this something. Hoping what it was. So I'm happy, but I don't, know how you see that that's going to be the same thing. And I don't want to use the belief method to just believe it. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, so let's let's just think about the representative function viewpoint here. So what are we saying? We're saying there are fewer, right, I'm getting mixed up here between the sort of Galois connection of it. We have fewer representative functions because we have more, more monoid elements. We have elements in the monoid that are not in the group, but our representative mm -hmm. functions have to survive uh, to those singular points of the monoid, the, the non-invertible elements of the monoid. Mm -hmm. um, and um,
right? So, right, E is the thing that blows up if you try to, you know, that, that's the whole purpose in life of E is to blow up at these non-invertible elements so that they will be excluded from the spectrum of this affine algebraic group. But if we're really seriously interested in this affine algebraic monoid and its co-algebras, then, you know, and we don't want to ex exclude those elements from the spectrum. And um, so, yeah, it all fits together in a very nice way. I mean, again, there are theorems and lemmas and stuff to prove here, but um, yeah, but that's what I'm claiming. That's what I'm claiming. Uh, okay, so if I'm wrong, somebody should, you know, prove I'm wrong. Go ahead, yeah? Well, that's how it works. <laughs> <Okay>, so. <laughs> so, so it uh, could be a version of math for like, <laughs> state as many things as you want and then you occasionally have a proof that some exactly. theorem exactly. falls um you know they progress much faster uh, right right but i was hoping to understand it so i was hoping that there might be something like well let's see So, I mean, there's this complementary way to the negative the representations, right? Yeah, but what are the representations? So you're saying it's the representations of two I2 matrices as a co-algebra. And so like, I know right. all about representations of two by two matrices as an algebra, unfortunately, but I don't. So like. Yeah, this, but this is just a generalization of the thing about the, you know, co-modules of the affine algebraic group. And like I say, it just, it just, it works very nicely. If, you know, if you understand that co-algebraic, co if, if you understand that co-module of co-algebra viewpoint towards the representations of GL2, then it extends very nicely to this uh, case of the, the 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 of this of this affine algebraic monoid of two by two matrices that are not necessarily invertible, and, and but the effect is that you're cutting down on the number of representations because um, mm -hmm. you know those are the representations that. I mean, they just don't work for the, you know, at, at the non-invertible elements. There's some better way of saying that, but it, it really does make sense. Uh, again, I mean, yeah, so, so, so we're getting fewer functions, fewer representations, but I'm sure we're getting more of something else. Let's see, um, more group elements, yes. <laughs> Geometrically, we're getting more group elements. It's this funny localization thing, yeah. Uh, we're more monoid elements, we're getting more monoid elements. The, the, the elements that don't fit into the group, but they fit into the monoid. Mm -hmm. And to, to, but as a trade off for that, we're getting fewer representations and fewer functions because uh, you know, the dual representation or the determinant function, they don't like the uh, non invertible elements in the monoid. They, 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 they blow up or something at those non-invertible elements. Yeah, well, you, but you're not, yeah, but okay. Well, it's fine well, as far as it goes, but you're not like really drawing the line of argument that shows like, okay, I can look at this theory. Yeah, I'm not giving the proof if that's what you mean, but yeah. aside from that, I, that, that is what you're complaining about, right? The fact that I'm not nailing down the proof, right? Yeah, and the proof should be something sort of nice, not some, not some sure, yeah. sure, okay. sure. Okay, but I, mean, I won't try to squeeze a a proof out of you. But uh, well, I, 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 it sounds like you want to be able to tell me the proof. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, if I have to, yeah, that's. A, <laughs> but I mean, we think so about it for one, a minute and a half. Think about it for a minute and a half. See if we can come up with the proof. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, and then I got distracted by the fact that these young diagrams in that yellow cone yes. are usually described to be the irreducible representations of 
SL2, I guess. Uh, no. The, the way you should think of the irreducible representation of SL2 is as a, it has a basis that's a quotient set of this basis. Um, and that set is the column set of this grid. Um, Wait, you know, including oh, no. the odd numbered columns. Yeah. So in other words, oh. SL. No, actually, I meant, believe it or not, I actually really meant SL3, which is even. Uh, oh. Which is, because I, yeah, because that's, that's weirder, which is why I said SL2, but if you, but I think it's true, but <laughs> it may not be very helpful, right? Until for understanding the basics, but. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. But that's interesting. Yeah, it's also peculiar. A, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's yeah too advanced for us. But well, uh, but yeah. I mean, the one thing that makes it interest might make it interesting is no, I don't think it does make it interesting. Okay, right. I, I think I can now claim that that's sort of not the right way to go because when you picture that as SL three, it really you should really make that wedge into like a. 60 degree wedge or something like that. Whereas in this picture, it's a 45 degree wedge. So there's, <laughs> some, you know, there certainly are games to play about connecting these, but there must be some, you know, weird extra dimensions that are making this wedge angle appear as a 45 degree angle in this picture. Whereas mm -hmm. in the conceptual picture that you're alluding to, I think it tends to be a 60 degree angle. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a good okay. it's a good thought, but it's it does sound a little bit. <laughs> I'm using I'm using that angle mismatch as a propaganda for why we shouldn't worry about it at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I don't really want to worry about it. Sure, sure. Now, <laughs> sure. Uh, well, okay, no, but but let me say something else about it. So let's think about the SL two. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said that you were trying to think about SL2, but uh, the SL3, but I think it will actually help if we think about the SL2, because what I'm saying is that the SL2 representations are actually the columns in this picture. And if you think about the, how the columns work, it says that you should consider all the height two columns in the, right? Okay, there, there are two meanings of column here going on here. There are the columns in the grid, and there are the columns in the Young diagrams. And unfortunately, they're both extremely relevant here. So let me try to say it again, distinguishing between the grid uh -huh. columns and the diagram columns. So what am I trying to say? That the, the way you name, the way that you name a grid column here is by an equivalence class of height two Young diagrams that all differ only in the height two diagram columns. So in other words, the, the height two diagram columns don't matter. So you get to get rid of them and you're really dealing with a height one young diagram. So mm -hmm. do you see what I'm saying? That's, so that's actually matching with what, with what you were saying about SL3 in a way. It is. Yes, except I'm doing it for SL2. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Oh, for, yeah, okay. Right. Okay. But anyway, so then you get the, I mean, are you talking about like these, you can pick representatives that are like right next to that yellow diagonal line, right? Height one di young diagrams. Yes. 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 Yes, on the other hand, <laughs> okay. But there are tricky things going on here. So, so let me say some things that are going on here. So, right, we're just drawing this as a set. So it's just like a, a basis for two vector space, roughly speaking. But um, remember that this, right? We're supposed to be able to tensor product these EREPs and get something that's not an era. So, right, if you pick any two of these dots, you can tensor them and you get a cloud of dots. Mm -hmm. 
you know, a multi dot, a multi set of dots or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you have a visual intuition for how that works? Uh, should, I, should I say my visual intuition? Yeah. Uh, I forget, but it's something sort of like you add the dots as vectors in this 2D vector space, and then you like throw in a whole bunch of <laughs> other dots that are like in this picture, like maybe up into the up into the left of them. But I forget. Yeah, I mean now. there are like trails. I mean, uh, I never took LSD, but my friends in college took LSD. All these told me about trails. So I mean, you add together the um, uh, the, the dots as vectors, like you said, and that's the leading term in the answer, but it has this trail of trailing terms. And, mm. and in this case, the trailing terms always trail off just in a perfectly westward direction. So, you, you know, even if you're even if you're adding dots that are like going down in way in a southerly direction, when you tensor them together, uh, the leading term is just their vector sum, but the trailing terms are um, are just going to the west of that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I'm saying here is that look at the horizontal line that goes through the red circle. And, and like I say, I claim that's the representations of PGL2. That's the representation of PGL. And we'll try to say what a sketch is for that at some point. But right now, just think of it as the representations of PGL2. Um, and you can see that because of the angle of the trails, that is closed under this tensor. But that's rather unusual. So this other angle that you were talking about where the one row Young diagrams are at the angle of that diagonalish side of the yellow wedge. Mm -hmm. um, that's not closed under tensor product because the trails go off to the west. Mm -hmm. um, so, right, if that's, again, there's some sort of duality between PGL and SL here, that the PGL things are, Yes. Okay. Let me let's, let me see if I can get close to say it right. So PGL is geometrically a quotient group, but that means that it's a sub two rig, and that's what we're seeing in the way the the syntactic category for PGL two is closed under this tensor product. Um, whereas SL two is geometrically not a quotient group; it's a subgroup. So that means instead of being a instead of being a sub two rig, it should be like a sort of some some variation on the concept of a quotient two rig. And basically, what it is is that all the dots in some grid column become isomorphic for SL two. For SL two, yes, that's right. That's right. Another cute little thing is that if you look at all the dots directly below the big red dot. Yes. So your philosophy claims correctly that they will be closed under tensor product because there's nowhere to the west to go. And yeah. that's because of the determinant of a matrix. That determinant is a subjective group homomorphism from GL1, if I understand what you're saying, if I'm not screwing up, GL, you know, GL1 is a quotient of GL2, a quotient group of GL2 via the determinant homomorphism. Mm -hmm. um, and that geometric quotient group corresponds to that sub two rig that you're pointing out. Mm -hmm. Agreed? I mean, that's what you yeah, just pointed out. Sounds right. I was thinking of it just in a stupider way that like those, those young diagrams in that vertical column there, those are all 
naming tensor powers of the determinant representation of GL2. And so, of course, when you tensor them, it'll just be addition in this plane here without any funny trails or anything. But yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I think one of the, sorry. <laughs> I have a feeling at some point when we were discussing the tensor product and the leading term and the trails, somewhere I probably intended to bring up the terminology of structure content constants and perhaps categorified structure constants. Uh, but I just couldn't think of the word at, at, the, at that point, but it just came to me. So, um, you know, structure constants when you express a multiplication in a basis or a categorified multiplication, a tensor product in a basis. Um, so, yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so what is this diagram that we're talking about here? I, I, I get a little bit confused by this, I mean, but um, we, we did draw this at some point. So what are we trying to say? We have, one axis is GL1, and another axis is S. No, the other axis is, yeah, I guess S, well, SL. Yeah, okay, which, which way should I say it? Um, I mean, I mean, let's draw that diagram again. G L N and the determinant uh, homomorphism to G L one. Is that right? And the kernel of that is S L N. Is that right? And then there's this quotient group, which is P G L N. And so let's see, that's an inclusion. This is a surjection. This is a surjection and the kernel is what? GL1 again, is that right? Yep. Yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And so we've got these composites and these are N to one composites. Am I doing this right? Um, certainly. So maybe I should draw them as projections. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, right. I, I, I guess, <laughs> right. Over the complex numbers, it would be legitimate to say that these are surjections and end to one things or something like that. And maybe that's what we should think about is the, the complex numbers. But but it does get trickier and perhaps more interesting if you think about the real numbers or all sorts of other weird things. Yeah. Um, but but does this look correct over the complex numbers? Um, let's see why that. And, and do we have other names for this? I mean, determinant is a name for homomorphisms. Do any of these other homomorphisms have names like determinant or inclusion of the constants or something? Is it? What I try to say that. Yeah, I don't know if they have great inclusion of center. You could say inclusion of the center. <laughs> yeah, but I'd rather say something more evocative, like inclusion of the scalars or. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Constants. I'll say inclusion of constant constant scalars. I don't know. Scalars is. You no like you're, you're choosing scalars? Yeah, I don't think people will know what a constant matrix is, but yeah. Okay, inclusion of scalars. I always slip and say diagonal. <laughs> right, right. Maybe I was thinking constant diagonal, constant on the diagonal. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I almost heard you say diagonal. Yeah. So right. right. Constants right. on the diagonal. Yeah. There's something like that. Constant diagonal, something like that. Yeah. Whatever. Multiples of the identity. Yeah. The inclusion of the scalars. Uh -huh. So right, if you include a scalar and then think it's determinant, um, that's not reversible because you collapse together all the roots of all the nth roots of unity or something. Did I say that correctly? No. Yeah. Okay. And um, I guess we just drew this for n equals two last time, but it mm -hmm. doesn't depend on n equals two. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling there might be some special things about the about this that do depend on n equals two. Because like, what what am I what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that. Um, Am I saying this right? That if you, right, we, we do this as a checkerboard grid, a half infinite checkerboard. That's what this grid is, half infinite checkerboard. But if you filled in the other half of it to make it a half infinite chessboard, then instead of that being the representations of GL2, right, so that would be saying, right, we're saying that, let me see if I can get this right, I'm, right? I'm saying that the GL2 stuff is, uh a sub two rig of this cartesian product stuff for this cartesian product group for which is something like the gl1 cross sl2 i think that's right yeah gl1 cross sl2 i thought you were going to say gl1 cross pgl2 <laughs> There's a map from GL2 to GL. I mean, you've drawn here like a map from GLN to GL1 yes. times PGLN. Yes, but okay, I, I'm uh, right, right. <laughs> but I, I think it's all going to work out, even if even if you're whatever, even if you have a legitimate complaint. I'm still hoping it's going to work out because I said that right. I'm saying that the GL2 basis of the the, the basis for the irreps of GL2 is a subset, a half size subset of the basis for the representations of SL2 Cartesian product GL1. Oh, so, okay. so, right, so that means it's a quotient group. Right, okay. Um, so, I'm, yeah, yeah, so I'm drawing some sort of quotient group diagram here. So it's like G, L1 cross, that's supposed to be Cartesian product symbol, SL2. And we have an, well, in, I, I, okay, we have a double cover uh, to GLN. Two. Say that again? Two, not N, but yeah. Would it work for N if we did? Uh, this, uh, this, this is one of the things I can't remember. Whether, I can't remember whether this is one of the things that does work when I two mean, becomes does. n. Well, it wouldn't be a double cover anymore, but it'd be. I think it'd get in. Right. I mean, your, your purple big fancy diagram does exhibit a map from yeah. GL one times SLN to GLN, and hopefully that's hopefully that's an n-tuple cover. <laughs> Yeah, so um, let's see. So GL1 and SL2. Right. I think part of part of part of the point is that GL1 and SLN, do they commute inside of GLN? Uh yeah. I think they do. And that means, yeah, so so that means that you could write, you can motivate this uh Cartesian product as being the right commutativized co-product. Uh, so right, that's right, right? I mean, it, 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 there are these, you know, these, these two maps from GL1, the two maps into GLN in the diagram are being sort of paired, to, they're being co-paired together, um, you know, and they map out of the commutativized uh, co-product, which is just the Cartesian product. So you're, I mean, right, it, it, normally you expect to have a universal property for mapping into the Cartesian product, 
But here I'm saying there's also a universal property formatic mapping out of the Cartesian product. But it has to do with the fact that I think these are these two subgroups are commuting with each other um, in some sense. Everything in GL, maybe, yeah, maybe it has to do with the fact that GL1 commutes with everything. <laughs> Is that right? You said something about that being in the center. Yeah, it's in the center. It's diagonal light. It's it is the center of or... the identity. It's exactly the center. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm saying yeah, th there is this chessboard, half infinite chessboard, which is this uh -huh. Cartesian product, and then you can see that we're just that that is a two to one cover of GL two, um, and that's why GL two only has half the representations. GL two only has the checkerboard. Uh, and that you know that all fits together with how you know PGL two is double covered by is it <laughs> let's see yes SL two double covers PGL two and so yeah there's many games that you can play here um, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah yeah okay 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 so uh, let's see so. Yeah, yeah. So like I say, I, I wrote down a presentation or a sketch for the yellow wedge thing, right? And right, right. So I mean, right, there is some interesting lemma here that uh, somebody must have written this down, right? That the, the universal property of this, Co-module category of this matrix. Uh, this this commutative bi algebra for the affine algebraic monoid of not necessarily invertible matrices. That th that this is this is giving us this syntactic category that's sketched out just by saying. According to me, I'm claiming, I'm, you know, I'm claiming that somebody should actually prove this theorem. Probably somebody already has proved this theorem, but I'm not sure who. Maybe Martin Brandenburg has proved it. Um, that um, this co-module category, the one for the bi algebra, not the Hopf algebra, but for the bi algebra, is sketched by just saying that we have subdimension two. Um, you know, just that the exterior cube annihilates or kills or whatever uh, the generator, the generating object V. Okay, well, that's nice. Um, <clears throat> Again, I wouldn't mind if you told me the proof of that right now, but- Well, um, I, I yeah. wouldn't either, but I can't, I can't do it, okay. um, but I might eventually do it. So Todd, Yes, in fact, I think I think it is I think it is actually easy to do, and it's easy to do via the belief method, and um, and but but I'm gonna you know I'm gonna weasel out of doing it right this second because I think that you know we have more interesting things to discuss right now. But sorry, I interrupted you. Can you go ahead and tell me what you're gonna say about, say about Todd? Yeah, Todd and Joe and I were gonna be studying the splitting principle. Yes, and there are there are reasons to think about. Things like the free thing on an object of subdimension and, or the free thing on an object of dimension and and so I that, might that that's interesting. I'm not sure I've thought about that subdimension concept arising in that context of the splitting principle. I'll, I'll it's think it's about sort that. of in yeah. I don't. It's not maybe it's not subdimension that really shows up. Uh, it might be though, from what you're hinting. It sounds it, like it might be. I don't know. I don't know. bump into it, but it may not be the right. It may be better to use dimension. I mean, the splitting principle should say something like, if you have an object of dimension n, then you can take your two rig and expand it out, embed it in a bigger one, where that object is a direct sum of n things of dimension one. That's oh. one way to state this splitting. Oh. So that yeah. sort of wants you to use yeah. dimension rather than subdimension. Sure, sure, sure. But somehow, like in blundering around trying to understand this, we like 
blundered into the concept of subdimensions also. So uh, I yeah, I'll, again, I'll have to think about that and maybe read the paper or something like that. Um, but well, we uh, didn't do the splitting principle stuff yet. So right, 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 right. Um, so the reason why subdimension shows up, sorry, is that yes. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm very interested in this. Go ahead. It's really. I mean, the reason why it's tempting is that right the, there's the the free thing on an object of subdimension one, and then there's like the free thing on an object of subdimension two and uh, three, and so there are maps between all of those, and I'm getting mixed up which way it goes, but it's sort of the obvious way because a subdimension yes. three things you can pad a vector space with an extra dimension trivial thing to make it higher dimensional. That's what you're talking about? Uh, I was just saying that anything of subdimension five will automatically be of subdimension. Oh, yes. Six. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. There are things so like that. Yes. That's yes. Like, so anyway, that's like very simple concept. Uh, yes. But if you work with dimension, yeah, I mean, it's true that with dimension, you can pad out a thing of dimension and to get a thing of dimension n plus one. Yes, you might be but, able to but you don't get away with that, get by with that. But you yeah. don't yeah. Well, but that's that's sort of a different kind of okay game. The the thing where you use subdimension. So like subdimension one includes in subdimension two, which includes in subdimension three. And there's some kind of co-limit of all of those, which is just the free thing on an object. Because you're like Sorry, I mean, I don't know if that's really true, but it's sort of like, well, if it, yeah, it, that's not quite true, but it's, it's sort of like if the conditions are getting weaker and weaker as you go along for larger and larger. And so you could, well, you could hope that like the condition of being subdimension n just sort of goes away as n goes to infinity. That's probably not quite that simple though, because <laughs> there are, there are things that, yeah, that, that, that vaguely, vaguely reminds me of issues that I've run into. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, are you sort of done here? Yeah. yeah. So um, there's, there's things going on here. So like, I mean, we've hinted at the idea that there are, you know, that you may be able to, and even if you are not able to, you should still try to do it. You should try to develop big correspondences between the kinds of two rigs that come from sketches and the kinds of two rigs that come as co-module categories. And you should right. look for sort of correspondences between things that show up on one side and things that show up on the other side. So one of the kind of correspondences that's showing up here, seems to be showing up, is that, uh, and, and maybe this is completely obvious, but I'll say it anyway, that for the co-module categories of bi-algebras, um, as total two rigs, those are not necessarily generated by objects with adjoint objects. Whereas, you know, for um, these commutative hop algebras, uh, you can write down a sketch for the theory which says you know that the generators have explicit uh, the generating objects have explicit adjoint objects, mm -hmm. um, and um, yep, yeah, that's. I mean that yeah that that fits with things that you told me about decades and decades ago. Um, right. Yeah, that's sort of a there's like a whole gamut of Tanaka crying like theorems, and that's sort of part of how you go from. Um, yes, yes, or... yes. But I, I also vaguely remember from a long time ago when you and I were sort of just learning what each other knew um, that, you know, you really liked representation categories of groups and I was just as happy with representation categories of monoids. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it turned out that I didn't really know <laughs> that, you know, what the difference in flavor was that the, you know, that these group uh -huh. group representations, right, and it, it, it's not even true that 
all group representations have adjoints because the infinite direct sums don't. But um, mm -hmm. but the syntactic category is generated by objects that have representations. And of course, if you're taking the attitude that you're working in some doctrine where you don't even have the infinite direct sums, you're just working with like absolute two absolute two rigs instead of total two rigs or something like that then you may be dealing with a situation where you actually get every object in the syntactic category to have a dual. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so, this, so there are these different doctrines, absolute two rigs versus total two rigs, where you, you still have the same theme showing up. The, the same theme, theme is that, you know, the semantic distinction between monoids and groups or perhaps between categories and groups um, has to do with the fact that representations of groups tend to have adjoints, or at least, you know, they, they tend to be built up from representations that have adjoints. Um, and um, well, the, the, I'm not sure I remember exactly what I was going to say, but this is this is going to be a, an important theme later on. Um, yeah, you know the category versus group flavors on the semantic side, and it's going to have to do with sketches that do involve adjoints, uh, sketches that involve you know, some sketches, every generating object has a uh, an adjoint, other sketches that they don't. And, and, and you know, so, so that syntactic feature corresponds to this, to some extent corresponds to, we should explore to what extent it corresponds to this semantic distinction between groupoids and categories. But in fact, I think I just remember what I was gonna say that, um, that, that when you when you start when you start thinking about this subtler you know there's this very direct concept of objects that have adjoints but then there's this somewhat subtler concept of objects that are co-limits of objects that have adjoints and you know, objects have have adjoints. That's something you think about possibly when you're working with absolute two absolute two rigs. But objects that are co-limits of things that have adjoints, that um, is something that you think about when you're working with total two rigs. And that subtler concept of um, objects that are co-limits of objects that have uh, adjoints. And again, this is probably something you already knew, but many people argue that that's the correct concept of the, the correct conceptual nature of quasi-coherence. That's what cause quasi-coherence really means. Mm. That means- um, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably correct, but <laughs> there may be some opposing philosophies, but that's certainly an interesting one, that, 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 that quasi-coherent really just means being a co-limit of objects that have adjoints. Uh, Oh, I, I'm not sure how successful that is, but I think it could potentially be a very successful definition of what quasi-coherence is as an abstract definition that holds in great generality. But, but, but we don't have to worry about that right now. Um, so yes, we're running out of time here, but we still have 20 minutes left here, let's see. Uh, so what am I trying to say here? Well, have we... So we've written we've written down a sketch for the uh, uh, for the yellow wedge, and I've claimed that that is a sketch for the that yellow wedge. Um, I'm not sure we wrote down a sketch for the whole half in an infinite checkerboard, but um, but I think we've sort of been taking it for granted that we sort of know what that sketch is. It's something like. The theory of an object V uh, well, I'll say it in a very sloppy way, but but 
but then you have to fix it and make it so that it actually is legitimate syntax in the doctrine. But I want to say something like the theory of an object V for which, don't tell me it. I want to say something like, uh, the theory of an object V for which the exterior square of V What if we said this, the theory of an object V for which the exterior square of V is invertible. That's not quite good enough yet. Let's see. Um, Why is that good enough? Say it again. Why is that not good enough? That would be, I would think of that as like. Well, I'm aiming for, I'm, I'm aiming for a, I'm aiming to get dimension now rather than subdimension. Yeah, go ahead. That would sort of make me think of representations of GL2. Yes, but unfortunately, it also makes me think of representation of GL. Oh, maybe you're right. Okay, so it doesn't, it shouldn't make me think of the representation of GL1. You're telling me that uh, mm -hmm. a one dimensional thing gets killed by the exterior square. Okay, yeah. so maybe that is true. So I think that's what you're telling me. Maybe that's what you're telling me that the. I hope this is correct. I hope I'm not making some stupid mistake that I've made many times before. Um, the theory of an object V whose exterior square is invertible. Now, again, that's sloppy syntax, sloppy informal syntax, but you can make that into precise syntax in the doctrine. Um, and I think you're, you're correct that that, in fact, gives us precisely the co-module category of GL2. And then you also asked about you know, SL2 and PGL2. Um, so SL2. I think I can do SL2 now. <laughs> OK, but don't, don't tell me yet. Don't tell me yet. Let me just, I'll, I'll give up in a moment, but let me just. Okay. Let me just think for half a minute here. I mean, should, is, am, I, am I allowed to think out loud or should I? That's all you ever do. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> hey. So, um, uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I, I have a, I have a that, guess. I, I'm not sure which would be more insulting that that's the only way I think or that that's the only thing that I say out loud. Um, let's see. Um, so uh, I want to say something like that it's exterior square um, I'm not sure. I'm not all sure that's right, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say it as a guess that I, I, I'm sure I could figure it out if I thought about it for a couple of hours, but I'll, I'll just say it as a stupid guess. Maybe it's the theory of an object V equipped with an arbitrary isomorphism from its exterior square to the tensor unit. Yeah, that's what I was going to guess anyway. So that seems good to me. That's yeah, sort of saying the determinant is one. Whatever. I mean, that's sort of that's a an extra structure you can put on the previous category that's sort of equivalent to saying yeah. that your two matrix has determinant one. So that's what I was going to guess anyway. So I'm happy with that, even though we. Yeah, yeah. Um. um so then I so okay. So then I want to know about. PGL2 because oh. P, sorry, <laughs> yeah, that's the one I don't know if I have any guess well, for. Well, I don't think we should worry too much about PGL2, but we can worry about it a little bit because I'm not sure it's that easy to do. But, but let me try to say a couple of things about it. So, what, what am I trying to say? I want to say something like, um, Well, first of all, what's the name of your student? The one who 
talks about looking into and looking out of an object. Christian Williams. Christian Williams. Um, so I, I just have a feeling that that's useful terminology uh, around here. That, uh, you know, I mean, for example, this example, we, we um, we we're thinking about this uh, co-module category of PGL two, and we can see it in this picture. It's this horizontal axis going through the red thing, and that actually is a total two ring. You can see that it's closed under a tensor product and everything. But we can, you know, try looking into. There may be all sorts of looking out of games that we can also do, but at the moment, I'm you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm actually looking at the picture of that, but in this technical sense of Christian Williams, I'm thinking about looking into that total two rig from various other total two rigs. So for example, there's the theory of an associative algebra or something like that. Well, I mean, first, first, of, all, I could, first of all, I could just to think of the theory of an object, the theory of an object and I can map that into this representation category of PGL2. And I can take our object to be the adjoint representation. Uh, is it clear where the adjoint representation is there? Should I kind of circle it or something like that? It's right there. Am I saying that correctly? Is that really the adjoint representation? I think that is the right. Yeah, because because each dot represents a each dot represents a an irreducible representation. Um, you know, so it, the red circle dot and the green circle dot. If you added those together, that would be the the uh, tensor square of the. single box Young diagram. No, <laughs> sorry. So, I mean, right, there are two different single box Young diagrams, the positive one and the negative one, right? We, mm -hmm. I didn't draw the Young diagrams for the Young diagrams applied to the dual representation, but those, it's the same Young diagrams, right? Yep. For the, the opposite wedge, um, the contragredient representation or something. But, um, so if you tensor together the, representation, the, the, the single box Young diagram with the other single box Young, Young diagram, the dual one, then those give, uh, you know, this four dimensional representation, mm -hmm. uh, just the tensor square, which decomposes as the red circled thing and the green circled thing, which is the symmet symmetrized tensor square and the anti-symmetrized tensor square. So that, mm -hmm. Symmetrized tensor square there, if I'm doing it right, that's the adjoint representation. Um, and, you know, so doesn't it seem clear that we're, we're not going to need any more object generators, right? If we're, if, we're, if we're trying to look into PGL2, into its syntactic category, its representation category, that one object should be all we need, right? So in other words, our sketch starts out saying that there's an object X or whatever, and X is that adjoint representation. And we just have to sharpen that sketch. I mean, that's right. That's already giving us a sort of surjective map to this syntactic category. But we just need to sharpen that sketch, add a whole bunch of more structure and property until the sketch is so, so sharp that we get an equivalence of syntactic categories. Right? Uh huh. So I have an idea about what I would. What, what my next sharpening step would be. Do you have an, any guess for what you would use as your next sharpening step if you're trying to um, So you're saying you guy? start by just sort of thinking of it as the theory of an object, but then you're yeah. like- okay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So just like, you know, it's just like if this, you know, this is like a categorified version of you know, somebody hands you a commuter ring that you've never seen before and you're trying to understand it. So you start trying to find a presentation of it. You know, yeah. you just pick an element. Did that generate everything? No. So we need another generator. Did that, yeah. did that generate everything? Yes. But then we need some more equations or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of playing a categorified version of that game. So I've, I've already hinted we don't need any more object generators. I'm pretty sure we don't need any more object generators. 
I it's think. funny how little I understand the representations of EGL2. The, ah, but they, it's just, am I, well, uh, if, if you think of the complex numbers, then it's just the same as SO3. Am I saying that right? Okay, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. It would be funny to replay this game working over the real numbers, and then you'd have to think about that. But if unless I'm screwing up, I think this is really just the representations of SO3 over the complex number. You know, sort of the complexified yeah. SO3 okay. is the same right. as complexified yeah. PGL2. Okay. I hope I'm not screwing that up. Yeah. Okay. So now well, you do I, now you do know everything about it. Now I know everything about it. And I know the, <laughs> and now now I remember I, I like wrote a paper about two Hilbert spaces, which could just give a like a this in that doctrine describe the unitary representations of SO3. But so that I can just sort of tweak that and guess that it would be like, um, it would be like a, a three dimensional object that is its own dual via a symmetric bilinear morphism. So I mean, that's interesting. I'll really have to think about that. Um, oh, I see. Okay, I guess what you're saying. Oh, That's right. right. The SO3 ah, so you're yeah. right. You're cheating and doing SO3 instead of PGL2. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to do PGL2 in a way that, you know, would generalize to PGLN. I was going to say uh -huh. something like, what was I going to say? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I was going to say something like, ah, this is getting tricky. Maybe I was going to say something like, uh, you know, instead of having X be the adjunct representation, maybe I was going to have it be the tensor square, have it be the, the, um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, you did give a good answer by cheating and using SO3. That's a perfectly good answer for that example. But I was actually thinking about, you know, trying to generalize this to PGL and, and I was thinking about how something, you know, if you take the tensor unit plus the adjoint representation, how that's an associated algebra. You know, that's a, a non-commutative tensor monoid. And so you could take the, you know, the, the, the you know, take your object, which was just an object, but now put it in, have it be a, a, a tensor monoid and then start adding more stuff. And there's all sorts of interesting things that happen. I don't have, I don't, I, that, that's about as far as I can go right now, but it's fun to think about. But um, I'm just very slightly tempted to say, <laughs> yes, this is, again, this is too interesting um, for, for now, but, but, but I just wanna give a hint that you could, like, right, suppose we were doing a PGLN, you could really try to give a sketch that really did very much work in terms of the flag geometry. Because PGLN really does just know about the flag. So in other words, what you would say, you would say something like, <laughs> this is very sketchy, but it's supposed to be a sketch, so it's a sketchy sketch. So you would say something like the theory of a projective variety, which secretly is going to be the one of the Grassmannians of this PGL, and another projective variety, which is another one of the Grassmannians. So you say that there are all these Grassmannians, and then you say that these projective varieties, when Cartesian product are together, they give there's like a relation that sits in there's a there's another projective variety that sits in their Cartesian product, and this would be the incidence relationship. So there's a way you can do this. It's a lot of work. It's very involved, but it's very nice in a way. And, Are you yeah? describing these varieties by their two rigs of bundles or, or uh, it, 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 that would That would get us into a little bit of higher dimensional loops that we don't know how to deal with yet. But we do something very much like that, which is instead of thinking of them, I mean, basically we use, you know, we, we use their projective embedding. So it's by, right, we use the polarization or the projective embeddings or something like that. So when I, in this case, when I say the, the theory of a projective variety, I, I don't have, again, I don't have any of the details of this work yet, but what I'm, 
aiming for is something like this, that you know, a projective variety has a homogeneous coordinate algebra, which is a graded commutative algebra mm -hmm. of a certain kind. And that concept of a graded commutative algebra, that, that parses in the doctrine. So you can mm -hmm. say the theory of a graded commutative tensor monoid uh, with a whole bunch of extra sharpening stuff mm -hmm. added on. And this would in some sense be like the moduli stack of all projective varieties, <laughs> right? It'd be the theory of a projective variety. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a start. And then you could sharpen that and you can make it so that these projective varieties, you can sharpen the theory, the sharpen the sketch so that these projective varieties are constrained to act like the Grassmannians for a particular kind of flag geometry. And like, like I say, you might have multiple Grassmannians and then an incidence relation between them in mm -hmm. the Cartesian product, which is itself a projective variety. And uh, so if, right. So one of the things that's going on is when, I, when in this case, when I say projective variety, I'm using projective, not as a mere property constraint, but an extra structure, right? That to give a projective variety is actually to give the projective embedding, projective in that sense, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, so equipped with a polarization or equipped with even more than a polar, equipped with an actual projective embedding. And in that way, in, in that way, you don't, you know, you don't have, you're not dealing with a two rig, it's sort of, you're dealing with a lower level thing, which itself, can live in a two rig, and in that way, it it it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I'm describing some very very fancy thing here, which I don't really know how to do yet. But it's it's, it's actually going to be very important later on when we start thinking about all sorts of things like geometric quantization of flag varieties and unifying that with geometric quantization of our abelian varieties. There's, there's all sorts of stuff that we're going to get into here. So, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the clock here to see. Oh, it's getting really late. Uh, there was something that I wanted to say more. Yeah, well, I have a question <laughs> I want to yeah. fill up the rest of the time with. I, you have a question right now? Go ahead. Yeah. I, I do so, have one thing. I do have one more thing that I want to say, but I don't know if I'll get to say it. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question was, for some weird reason, I never asked you, like, why did you decide to think a bunch about abelian varieties or have me, <laughs> make me think a bunch about abelian varieties you never really si said like i mean they're all they're they're nice okay i <laughs> i like them a lot but like you seem to be i seem to be thinking that this is like some important special playground yeah we yeah, yeah yes yes i mean i mean there's this there certainly are motivations is that a pun I guess it is an unintentional. Because that's one thing you muttered once. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the Abelian varieties are very related to one motives, I think, if I haven't miscounted and if I haven't completely misunderstood. Um, so yes, I was going to try and mention, well, I'm sort of hoping that all my motivations are all secretly the same motivation. But at this point, I can't guarantee that they are secretly the same motivation. So I'm going to mention three motivations here. And one of them is the one that you just mentioned. If you're trying to understand what the hell motives are, then I think Abelian varieties are related to that in important ways. And particularly in the way that Abelian varieties arise as Jacobians or whatever you call them, Albanese varieties, Picard varieties, all those roughly equivalent things. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the answers. <laughs> Another answer is, a bit of a crackpot crazy answer, but but I'll tell you it anyway. So um, <laughs> it has to do with all this mystical stuff about the Heisenberg group and how you know Heisenberg group is related to quantum mechanics. And um, <laughs> that's fine. It's well, I mean, the, I, yes, is... and in fact, and, and in fact, it's, I have I I have very oh, crazy ideas about how this is related to string theory. So, in fact, I, I, okay, I have a really stupid idea. It might not make any sense at all, but it goes something like this. How does this work? String theory is to algebraic curves as quantum mechanics is to 
the Jacobian varieties of algebraic curves. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a crazy idea, but I, I actually have been thinking about that. Um, that, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I'm just gonna leave it there for a moment. That, uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. And the third motivation that I was gonna give is a sort of um, something that I wrote down in my notebook today that from my point of view, um, thinking about a, a being varieties is sort of like really asking for it. In, for me, asking for it in the sense that, you know, I have this program to really try to understand all of algebraic geometry as much as I can in this very doctrinal, doctrinaire, doctrinish way. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the billion varieties uh, really represents a challenge to that viewpoint in a way, partially because there's so much, so much of what you do with the billion varieties in understanding them in a naive way has to do with transcendental functions. I mean, the universal cover, right. I'm very interested in this, you know, this idea of thinking of understanding abelian varieties by means of this method of descent from the universal cover. But when you do that, you're really thinking about transcendental stuff. So you're really thinking about complex manifolds more than about algebraic varieties. And you've been bringing this in as we've been thinking about this because you know, you've been talking about these complex choruses, which aren't even being varieties. And, and that's good, but it's, again, it's, it's tricky to figure out where this fits into the doctrine picture. I mean, this, this whole Gaga theme of relationships between algebraic geometry and more transcendental stuff, more analytic stuff. Um, there's things going on there. Mm -hmm. so, so partially, yeah, so, so that third motivation is sort of like deliberately going into the deep waters of going beyond algebraic stuff to transcendental and analytic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but as but as we return here, I'm, I'm suddenly realizing perhaps a fourth and a fifth motivation. So a, a, a fourth motivation is that this, re, you know, I was really interested in the language program and moduli stacks. See, when, when I try to understand the language program, one of the things I run into try to understand is moduli stacks of, well, moduli stacks of abelian varieties, which really occur, like, you're right, what, what's that? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember the buzz names here. Who's that person? Seagull, the, mm -hmm. the upper, what's it called? Seagull upper, upper half space. Yeah. Uh -huh. Seagull upper half space. That's the sort of thing that you really run into if you're trying to understand certain very vanilla parts of the language program. But when you give a conceptual interpretation to the finite things that find the, 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 the compact things that that Seagull upper half space rent. The automorphic stuff, the automorphic aspect of the Siegel F half, half space, you're, you're looking at moduli stacks of abelian varieties. Moduli stacks of abelian varieties have a lot to do with um, the automorphic aspect. I'm not remembering the correct jargon here, but the automorphic morphic aspect of the Siegel F half space, which is. So, something that you think about when you're trying to understand things like the language program in the special case of the symplectic group, mm -hmm. the real, real symplectic group, maybe also complex symplectic group or something like that. So, so that's a fourth motivation. And then maybe, maybe there's a fifth motivation, which is sort of trying to wrap these all together. And it has to do with the way that these moduli stacks of being varieties, they you try to understand them as in this bigger sort of Langlands-ish picture of moduli stacks of Hodge variety, Hodge structures. And these Hodge structures are really related to these abelian varieties and these motives and everything. <laughs> so uh -huh. and maybe it's related to a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's the fifth 
fuzzy partial motivation, sort of trying to tie a whole bunch of these things together. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, so that did succeed in uh, taking us a little bit past six. There, of course, I showed up five minutes late, so um, maybe, maybe that means okay. So, I mean, the question is: Should we stop right now, or should I try to give you one last? Uh, I, I, I got settled for stopping right now, but I'm tempted to try to give you one five minute punchline. Um, I'm, I'm afraid. Sure. I should stop now. Okay, I've that's fine. Tons of work to do. These days, <laughs> right. Unfortunately. Right. right. All right. I'll probably wait up for the punchline. I'll probably wait till the next time I get a chance to talk. But maybe, maybe I'll try to send it an email or something like that. And I'll probably wait till we get a chance to talk again. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I'm I mean, yeah. I mean, as usual, they're so busy. Uh, sure, sure. The way to make sure I pay attention to you is to is to tell me when we talk. Like I didn't even yet catch up on one last email of yours. Where I just, sure, that's that's so that's that's fine. I can, yeah. yeah, I mean that's that, that right. That makes it all more likely that I'll focus on talking compared to email. But there's still some things I should try to do by email. Uh -huh. um, boy, there's some really fascinating stuff going on in the email, which seems like it's not related to this stuff, but it really is related to this stuff. Um, uh, I forget what I was gonna say. Well, just, I guess I was gonna say that I always forget punchlines. I always have punchlines that I want to tell you that I forgot to say. This time I didn't actually forget to say it. I just ran out of time to say it. So I'll, I'll have some more punchlines to tell you about next time. So let's just quit here for now, if we're okay. ready. So thanks a lot, this was great. Okay. Okay, sure. bye.